I'd like to introduce myself. We've got 20 minutes, so it's not an awful lot of time to do uh, what I think was quite an ambitious pitch this morning, but we'll try. Uh, the talk is going to be in English, I'm afraid. Uh, my only French is, well, mostly non-repeatable, <laughs> which I apologize for. Um, so uh, I'll try and go through what I'm doing in English. On the plus side, can you hear me all right with the microphone? Am I, am I all blurry or is it, is it okay like this? Yeah, you're my sound check. Thanks. Great. Sorry? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that means people can hear what I say on the video. <laughs> it's no good. Right, I'm sure you're all a bit um, slide blind after today. So I'm not using the slide deck. My sum total of my slides is zero, although I am going to use uh, some programs. I'm going to do something practical. Um, unfortunately, I've... I need to hold the microphone while I'm doing it, so it might be a little bit clumsy. Okay. So um, what I wanted to do was uh, talk about the value proposition of using or of building um, x86 versions of your applications. I'm going to read from the book of Steve, which um, I think is slowly becoming an internet sensation. You may see this image somewhere. Short notice presentations. So. <clears throat> Potted history. Um, Intel, over the last couple of years, you may have noticed that Intel have started to move into the tablet space and phone space. We're making chips. People say, why? Okay, there's 1.6 billion, I think, devices in the world. Someone will correct me on that. I think that was Gartner. I'm not sure. Uh, and at the moment, we're approaching, we're not there yet, but we're approaching kind of uh, 100 million Intel devices. So people say, I say to people, well, could you... Can you kind of uh, you know, do an x86 version of your game? And they say, well, why? There are only 50 million tablets. Uh, and I say, well, there's, a, uh, there's more to it than the available market. Okay? Um, building for uh, including x86 in your build gives you access to a whole range of tools which I want to give you a quick look at. Now, I said this morning, uh, I made a very bold statement to say I'll show you how to improve the performance in your game. And hopefully, that's what I'll be able to do with this. OK. Um, do we have any? I assume we're all uh, developers. Are we all software developers? Anyone anyway, not a software developer? Well, OK. Um, it might, it won't get that technical anyway. It's OK. I haven't got time to get too technical. OK. So, um, has anyone encountered a program or a suite of programs called GPA, a graphics performance analyzers? from Intel? No? Well, you have, obviously. You wrote it. OK. <laughs> right, so, um, right, so GPA is a suite of programs which um, even people who have actually heard of it think it's purely for, uh, purely for PC, for analyzing PC games, analyzing PC graphics pipelines. Well, it is. But it also works with Android devices. Now, this is uh, the kind of typical starting point for GPA. This is a tool called System Analyzer. And I'm going to look at that. Uh, for if we'll have a quick look through this, then, and then I want to have a quick look at another one of the programs. But like I said, 20 minutes, a bit tight. So if I plug in a remote device with the elbow attachment there, the device sitting here on the, oh, who's unplugged it? Is that you? <laughs> One hand, I'm going to put it down. Oh, well, it's put it all back, isn't it? So, right, put the device in. And hide that window, and something magic happened behind it. What did we do? So, another device has appeared on here. The top one is the local machine, and you can use that to analyze games on the local machine. The bottom one is this uh, Bay Trail tablet. Bay Trail, incidentally, um, this is our, uh, one, of our, one of Intel's many, many millions of code words. If you go and look at Wikipedia, you'll see what I mean. Um, but this device, uh, it's not a commercial device. You'll probably see that it's covered in sticky labels and bits soldered back on because uh, I keep having to fix it. It's a prototype machine, OK? But I still find it works. And uh, uh, you, you don't get the clutter of having uh, uh, any extra any extra programs on there? Right. So if I connect to this device, what the program should do? <laughs> come on. Yeah, it's going. No, it's not. 
some famous some some famous actor once said, "Never work with uh, was it children and animals." Well, I'm going to include tablets as well in that one. All right, I'll try again. Okay, so what I get here is a list of um, applications installed on the tablet, and tablet still doing what it normally does. So I'm going to pick one of these. I'm going to pick this program here, uh, Angry Bots. Does anyone work with Unity? Yeah, we've got one. Is that another one? OK, yeah. Recognize the name. It's the sample that comes with Unity, yeah? OK. For some reason, that's popped up again. I'm going to close that. All right, and it didn't work. Let's just try again. I wonder why that is. Never work with children, animals, and tablets. Right. <laughs> Sounds really bad anyway, doesn't it? Right, so let's go and uh, okay, another embarrassing moment. We'll get there, I promise. So I'm left-handed, and I'm trying to drive the mouse with my right hand. Let's try again. We should get there this time. Right, okay. I'm not going to hold the device up in case I press the back button. Okay, but take it from me, Angry Bots is now running on the device. Now, this is a, a tool for um, uh, doing a kind of a holistic kind of analysis of your application. This is now is free. Go to intel.com uh, or search for Intel GPA on Google, and you'll find a link to this. You can download this and just use it. Okay. So uh, let's take a look down. What, I've, what we have is a list of metrics on the left, which have been extracted from the machine. Now, what I said earlier about um, it's not just about how many machines are on the market, uh, it, this is kind of the crux of what I'm saying. Because all these metrics coming back from the machine, the majority of these you won't get from an ARM device. You'll only get them from an x86 device. Um, it's not a, you know, we're not being, uh, we're not being horrible there. The fact is that we can access all the low level kind of secret performance counters on our processors, but we can't access them on other people's. I mean, that's just not fair. We can't do it. It's not safe. So what we can do with all these metrics that we have listed on the side, and like I said, there's quite a few of these. What we can do with these is we can um, I'll take them and drag them across to the main, the main display. And what I have on the display at the moment is the four CPU counters. You can see those here. And uh, the frames per second at the bottom. And what you can see from the top straight away, okay, it's the four core system. And the top two, these two of the threads, or two of the cores, are going kind of pretty much flat out. They're 50% of the processor each. Uh, and the other two aren't doing anything. I'll come back to that later. Remember that. Right, a few more things we can look at. Um, what I find is, is these metrics are great in pairs. And it's a really great place, uh, a really great place to go uh, to see how you've done in uh, the assembly of uh, your application. So if I take this obvious one, which is like number of draw calls, number of draw calls per frame, normally look at this because the more calls you make, uh, the more significant the load is in the driver. So a really important thing is to keep the number of draw calls down. So you usually do that by batching together uh, kind of draw calls of the same material or the same, you know, use the same mesh, that sort of thing. And, uh, and it looks like in this application, They've done pretty well with that. And then if we pair up number of draw calls with a really obvious one, again, vertex count. Right. So the vertex count on, in, in this is pretty steady. It's a steady image. Well, there's a thing flying around. Um, is uh, 77K. So can anyone do 70, 70, 77K over 140? It's about, I don't know, a uh, couple of hundred, is it? No. Do it right. Do it right. OK. Quite a few. That's, not my, that's the best answer I can come up with in front of an audience. So we've actually got quite a high vertex count per draw call, which is great. If you start to see something like maybe 50 or 20 or that sort of thing, that's something that is worth looking at because the fewer, ver the fewer vertices per draw call you have, uh, the more frequent you have draw calls. And so you're going to start hurting the driver, hurting the operating system by loading it down with, 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 with communication with the graphics card. Right. So. Um, that's the first one, then number of draw calls. Next thing to look at is uh, these states. So let's t take a look at the total number of states. Let's take a look at that. So by state, by state changes, I mean any call to GL set, GL get, anything like that. Okay. 
And ideally, you want as few as possible. Now, the driver, all the dri all drivers kind of batch these and only change them when it's really important to do so. Uh, but they, it, they can't always tell when you're going to use them and when you're not. Right, so it's always best to get this number of draw calls, a uh, number of state changes per draw call as low as you can. So this application is round about seven or eight. I did that math in my head. So this one's round about seven or eight, which is fantastic. Uh, I've seen, uh, I'm not going to point to anyone, but I've seen applications where there's been 30 or 40 state changes per draw call. It's really easy to do. Okay, and once again, uh, actually this, this is interesting. This is an interesting thing to say because you still see this a lot in games, this idea of having a high number of state changes per draw call. And like sort of back in the late 1990s with early Xbox, uh, I went to see a guy called Richard Hoodie. I don't know if you know him. I went to see a guy called Richard Hoodie talking at one of the Xbox conferences. And back then he was saying, his, his catchphrase was batch, batch, batch. Well, it's still the same now, yeah? Put draw calls together so that you get the fewest possible state changes. And don't just like set every state, do a draw call, set every state, do a draw call, yeah? Get a bit of code together that stores the changes between them and maybe even sort them so you get the fewest changes from draw call to draw call. Uh, you will reap benefits from it. It's a great way of uh, getting a quick kind of performance improvement. So uh, this application, instead, just a quick aside, this application is already doing sort of 38 to 40 frames per second. So you might think, well, why optimize anyway? Okay, the fact remains that uh, if you optimize it even further, then the CPU and GPU are going to be less busy. So if you still hold the frame rate at about 30, then all of a sudden you're using less power. And less power means longer battery life and people love your game. There's nothing people hate more than a game which kind of kills the battery in 20 minutes. And it is possible to do that. Um, uh, I won't tell you that story because I may have to mention the name. Uh, it has been done before though. Um, so it is possible if you just leave a, leave a frame drawing with just one polygon being drawn on it, and let it go flat out, you can get up to sort of like seven or 800 frames a second, and you can, you can almost hear the battery going down. It's, that it's going down that fast. Okay, so that's a couple, right? So uh, other ones to look at. Um, as I mentioned power, you can look at the, uh, uh, the, discharge, the power discharge, and it's in the uh, twos to four, uh, four is bad. One is good. Okay, so what's happening is that there's is pr pretty obviously there are like sort of major frame updates and then minor update frame updates going on, and that's why you've got kind of the, the, the peaks and troughs and so forth. Okay, let's look at uh, another. Right, let's well, suppose we've looked at this and we found that the number of, uh, number of actual state changes is okay. Something else we can look at is this one, bind texture calls. And I always think this one's a real eye-opener. This tells you straight away uh, who's... I oh, we need to go back to the number of draw calls up there again, don't we? Sorry, I digressed. Right, this is great. Look at this. I've got half as many bind texture calls as I have draw calls. So that suggests that these have been batched already. Yeah, so someone's done a really good job of this. Uh, let's take a look. So a couple of the singles I'll look at in these as well. Uh, it's always worth having a quick look to see uh, number of render target changes. Because it's funny, sometimes you get kind of effects that seem like a good idea, but you write them in a kind of procedural way. Okay, where you do kind of ping pong in between textures and you're doing multi textures into one and so forth, and you got multiple outputs. And the number of render target changes can get out of hand really quickly. So it's always worth looking at that. Four, it's reasonable. Maybe shadow, yeah, maybe lighting effect, maybe a post process. Fine, great. Okay, so this is actually a good app. Uh, something else I like to take a look at is the number of render target clears. Render tar mobile devices, you've probably all noticed already, mobile devices are getting bigger and bigger in the screens, yeah? 2560 is appearing now, 4K is coming, yeah? Clearing a screen that size is really expensive. So alarm bells should be ringing if your number of render target clears is kind of over kind of two, three. Yeah, because they're really expensive. You'll see, I'll, I can show you a practical example of that in a minute. And uh, right, there's lots more we could look at, but I want to move on from this. So just a quick thing at the end here. There's a series of, uh, in this tool, a series of overrides you can apply, and these are great to, great to mess with. Uh, you can see the effect on the, on the device. So, 
if I want to find out kind of, you know, how much, you know, how much of my time has been spent in the driver, I mentioned draw calls earlier, yeah, and lots of draw calls equals lots of driver time. So if I click on this null hardware button, you'll see that the, number, the, the frame rate doesn't really go up. So that tells you something specific about this application. It means the driver isn't really taking any time. If a driver was taking time, then the frame rate would go up quite a lot. And what that suggests is this game is actually far more heavily loaded on the CPU than it is on the GPU. If we pop back now up here to the GPU load, uh, I'm sorry if I'm droning on. I've been talking all day to people. Um, right, if I look at GPU busy, very subtle one, we'll find out, in fact, that, yeah, the GPU is doing virtually nothing, kind of 3%. 3, 4.3, 0.4%, not doing very much at all. So what that means, in fact, is if we want to make this game go faster, we need to go and look at the CPU and try and cut down some of the CPU load. Yeah. Again, making it faster is great, because you make it faster, what you do is uh, you increase the frame rate, then if you clamp it, there's a period when the CPU is idle and the GPU is idle, so then you save power. Right. So other toys, uh, so that, that's basically the heads-up display. And you can sit and play with that for hours with your app and, and see and find all sorts of wonderfully embarrassing things. Um, so just quickly now, if I hit this camera at the top, uh, this is capturing the current frame. The frame on here freezes. You can kind of watch it and pick the right frame, hit the right frame, and so on. So I've captured that frame. I'm going to close this tool and open this one, Frame Analyzer. We, we're really kind of... You know, clever with our names. We we pick kind of smart names for these tools, right? So uh, that's the third, that's the one I just sampled. If I go and open that, should be okay. Again, never work with tablets. And here she comes. Hmm. Okay. So we've got uh, what we have on this. It's a complicated display. Uh, the graph at the top is sequentially going across is, is draw calls during the frame, or actually graphics events, not just draw calls. Okay, and the color change where we swap over this white line in the middle, that's a render target change. Then I think there's a couple more render target changes hidden at the end. Right now, it's it's quite useful. It's quite useful to look at just to stand back and look at this for a moment and see what's happening. Right, we have a big, a big session here with very little going on. The height here, by the way, is the duration, how long the draw call took. And across is just sequentially the number of draw calls. Right, if you remember, kind of 153, that was the number of draw calls we had in the previous frame, in the pre previous, previous program. Right, so this first section here is completely, it's got loads and loads of draw calls on it that are taking no time whatsoever. And then the second section loads. Now, they kind of surmise from that this is some kind of effect being built. It might be shadow buffer, light buffer, something like that. And then at the end, uh, the last half, we've got the actual frame being rendered. And what I like to do, I, I, I usually like to concentrate on the frame that's being rendered and look at what I like to call like low hanging, if everyone calls it low hanging fruit. Yeah? The, big, the big columns, they're the ones you go and look at. So it's kind of, it's pretty easy to see that that's the biggest one. And the question that springs to mind is, which one is it? Or what is it? Now, normally this would be, uh, uh, well, I'll draw it in a second. For some reason, it's not highlighting it. I think this is an experimental version of GPA that I got a hold of. Anyway, uh, it's pretty easy to see. If we go and look at the, on these tabs over here on the right, if we go and look in here, and you can see Straight away, this is a big piece of landscape. Yeah, it's part of the floor, probably. Yeah, so if I, there's many, many options around here. I'm not going to enumerate all of them, but if I tell it to only draw uh, the, only draw the draw call that I've selected, then what you'll see at the bottom, hopefully, okay, is just a piece of floor. Okay, now, so. It's a big draw call. It's very expensive. It's, well, not very, but relatively compared to the rest of the frame, it's very expensive. But it takes up a lot of real estate. Okay, It's a big contributor to the, to the scene. And that's what you want. 
You want things that take up more scene to take more time to draw, and things that are little dots to take less time to draw. Um, I once worked on a football game uh, a long, long time ago, and we had a performance issue on that that turned out to be the footballs. An artist had, had exploited the football with 50,000 polygons in it, and no one noticed. So uh, it was drawing this. Uh, bear in mind, this was like back in DirectX two days. You know, it was uh, quite an expensive thing to draw. Anyway. And the rest of the frame, we can take a look at another one. There's one. This looks, you know, uh, can we, we've kind of memorized this now, the shapes. Yeah, this is a piece of floor once again. Uh, I'm not going to zoom that. We haven't really got time. I think we're probably running out, actually. Um, so other things you can do in here are, well, you should be able to look at the shaders, but you can't at the moment. But for particular draw cores, you can go and look at what textures they use. So what have we got here? Uh, so here's kind of uh, uh, low detail to do. That's interesting. That looks like a lighting map. Okay, where else are we using? So there's again, it's quite a large, quite a large contributor to the scene. So there's no point worrying about that. This purple line at the start. Now we mark all our clears in purple because they're easy to spot. So taking a look at this one, um, it's just a clear screen. And the screen is, what, uh, 1920 by 12, you know, 1128. It's not even a, a really big one. And you can see already it's actually quite an expensive draw call for the, for the size of the scene. It's like one and a half milliseconds. And something I always tell people to do is go and take a look at, there was much in this tool. You need to go and download it yourselves, check it out, see what you can find. There's helps and sample programs and things as well. So I can look at the API log of calls that led up to that particular erg. So I've got a whole load of uh, sets and so forth. And then down at the bottom, what I find is the GL clear command uh, clears the stencil, well, clears the, the depth buffer. That's fair enough. It clears the stencil buffer also. Well, fair enough if you're using it. And it clears the color buffer. Why does it clear the color buffer the whole screen's written to? The only time you don't, the only time you need to clear the depth buffer, uh, the color buffer, is if you're just going to be writing additive to it at the start of the frame. If you're not, you don't need to clear that bit. And that will probably take about a quarter off that draw call anyway. OK. Um, so let's take a look at this first half and find out what all these draw calls are. So these are all, I'm going to pick one. Come on. Right handed mouse work, very difficult. Let's do a bigger one. Right. So and this is the render target. It's, these are the render targets down the left. Normally you'll see a few more of these, I dare say. So I've got a call there. And it's a call to GL draw elements. Look at the geometry. It's actually just a couple of things. And if we go all the way through here, all the things that we look at, you'll see the little squares, rectangles, and so forth. What are they doing? Interesting. What they're actually doing is generating a light map, which, can, uh, which they use in their kind of surface, like dithering surface specular rain effect, which looks really cool. So then I started thinking, well, you know, it's a big, it's a big series, it's a big set of calls. But then again, the end effect is really cool. So if you want to come and look at it, if you haven't seen it, if you want to come and look at it, you can see the the lighting effect on the device is pretty good. Okay, so um, that's kind of I, I could show you lots of things in here, but I, I'll kind of stop there. Um, uh, does anyone fancy using this? Anyone fancy a go with this? Is it kind of the kind of thing that you might like to might like to use? Think so? Yeah, a couple of people. Yeah, like I said, you can find it. Just search for Intel and GPA, and there it'll be. Right. So uh, this is not the only thing I'm harping on about today. Uh, if you remember at the start, I said uh, uh, I was talking about building for uh, building for x86 devices. So um, a lot of developers are doing this already. Okay, you know, there's a big benefit for doing it. You get kind of less, so the, first, the first and most important one is you get less, less uh, uh, support calls and so forth. But right, I'm going to put this away and I'm going to open, and this is a sneak peek. All right, I'm going to open a copy of Unity. Only a couple of people said they'd used it. Okay, so um, this is actually from the closed beta, so don't take any photographs. And I know you're videoing it, but I'm sure you'll blur it out at some point. No, it's okay. Uh, it's been shown quite a bit anyway. So uh, I've got an application loaded here, which is actually that Angry Bots app that we talked about. 
And what I can do now, now that, uh, right, so we've been working with, with Unity for the last kind of couple of months uh, to make, uh, to, to just try to make a small, well, it sounds like a small change, but actually it's quite a big change on their side because there's a whole load of code that had to be kind of like ported and checked. Okay, uh, and what we've got now, if you look at the, uh, look at the uh, settings for the player, uh, what we have is there's a drop down here now where you can specify a device filter. So really easily, uh, without even thinking about it almost, you can build a fat binary that supports ARM7 as well as x86. Yeah, and then just vump straight out. Uh, you may have a couple of little problems, like if you've used ARM specific or uh, uh, PowerVR specific textures or something like that. Yeah, if you've got any kind of neon source code, uh, if you've got any neon source code in there, uh, no, we've got none of that as well. Then hey, it's pretty cool, and you just pump it out. And uh, uh, there's a couple of tiny gotchas, right? But they're not huge, and they hardly ever show their faces. Yeah, so then. Cheapest chips, you can get yourself a, a, an X, X86 executable. So what does that do for us? Well, if you upload that, it's an old story now, but uh, if you upload a fat binary to Google Play, then what happens is if you've got an X86 device, then the X86 executable gets downloaded. If you've got an ARM device, then the ARM executable gets downloaded. Yeah, So we can all kind of live happily in the same pool. And all of our customers, that's kind of, let's face it, I mean, if you're game developers, your customers are the same as ours, if people who buy computers and play on them. Yeah, and what it means is they've got more choice, yeah, and there's a wider range uh, of, of, of targets for, for, for you to sell the game on. Right, so that works pretty well. Any questions? Yeah, okay. I actually give you, I have two questions. Uh, oh, first okay. of all, th thanks for showing us uh, the tools. It's oh. pretty impressive. Okay, thanks. Uh, I wondered if uh, the game, uh, say I use the profiler to track, uh, I say, uh, a moment where my drop calls are, my draw calls are uh, rising and I fixed uh, the problem. Yeah. Uh, how much will that be fixed in the ARM, uh, in the ARM version? I what I'm trying to say is, ah. can I use this profiler and kind of uh, presume that the fix that I will do will also affect the ARM version? It will affect the ARM version. 99 times out of 100, it won't hurt it. Yeah. So if you have a, a basic issue like the ones that I mentioned, say where you've got a lot of state changes per draw call, that would be great for any device. Yeah. If that code's being ported onto Mac or GL, that, that'll be the same. That'll be better as well. Okay. Yeah. And the other, uh, the licensing model, you mentioned that it was uh, free to download, but is it free to use for commercial purpose? GPA. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Really nice. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Probably won't be forever, but right now, yeah. Free tool. Yeah. Help yourselves. Okay. Any more? Any more? We've got one here. So with GPA, can you set like thresholds? At certain points, so if it cross over a certain threshold, you register a certain some information that you can analyze later. Okay, one of the things that I haven't mentioned, uh, there are many things about GPA I haven't mentioned. There is an API that you can plug into your game or app, yeah, and then you can control all that yourself. Yeah, you can set markers that appear on the graphs, yeah, and all this kind of thing. Now, um, I don't think it, it's not kind of no, you can't set a specific threshold. So, you know, if you're saying, like, just show me draw calls that are over a certain size, is that what the sort of thing you're saying? Yeah. A certain yeah. number of draw calls, right, yeah. within a period. Yeah, okay. Um, no, but it might be interesting, you know. Uh, the GPA team will always take take suggestions, yeah, for, yeah, unless I've misunderstood your question. No, it's that the other thing was that I think it'd be useful to have, like, the video of the game with respect to the GPA I see, right. Okay, well, uh, you do get the frame, the current frame that's been captured, right. which you can look at, okay? And uh, that'll kind of highlight the draw calls that you're looking at, and it'll give you kind of uh, all the different, st loads of stats about it that I still haven't shown you because we've only got, well, we've probably had more than 20 minutes, but we've only got 20 minutes. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, how are we doing? You're a bit late, or are you early? 
Sorry. Never mind. Never mind. Right. Okay, that do. Any more questions? Right, let's get a cup of coffee. Thanks.